I was getting a PhD in physics, and I, a f about almost three years ago, I got interested in Bitcoin when I just heard about it for the first time. I was reading Hacker News, and I was just really immediately fascinated with Bitcoin on a technological level. So I started researching it and stuff, and it became this big hobby of mine, and recently I, I just ditched my PhD and went full-time Bitcoin. So that's sort of the theme of my talk, but I want to talk about a lot of other things as well. Stuff that I'm working on now in the Bitcoin world and stuff. But I want to start with this. This is, I think this is so interesting. So uh, this is a plot of the hash rate of the network up until around the time when I first discovered Bitcoin in 2011. So the hash rate is, you know, how many hashes per second. So we're talking 700 giga hashes per second there at the very end, right? And we start here at January 3rd, 2009. That's a Genesis block. So it's, it's clearly exponential. It's kind of this ridiculous exponential plot, right? Like, it's, it's so low. I mean, it's increasing this whole time. It was very flat at first, but it increases, increases exponentially. And then it increases so much, like, you start to really notice it near the end. And this is just characteristic of exponential curves, right? This is just how it looks. So now check out this plot from now. This is just the same plot except it doesn't end in 2011, it ends in 2014. It is still exponential and it's so much higher now. That point there at March 4th, 2011, which was the peak of this, this previous plot here, looks like nothing. It looks like this flat line and zoom all of a sudden because it increases so rapidly like we see almost all of the increase there just at the, at the very end but it's been exponential this whole time and what this is is these are the new computers and stuff on the network uh, originally people use desktop computers and they use graphics cards and they use special ASICs and stuff and now they're like just blowing up making uh, 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 you know more and more custom hardware there are more and more companies that do this stuff so the hash rate is just going through the roof so I, I just think that's absolutely amazing the other interesting uh, plot is the price. So it's a little bit hard to see because the bars are small here, but this is the same thing. This is a plot of the price of Bitcoin on Mt. Gox, actually, up until 2011. Well, Mt. Gox was actually the only exchange back in 2011. So this is just the best plot I have. So it's showing the, the price up to, you know, from, from 2010 to 2011, so it's one year. Here's another plot of the price from 2012 to 2014. So this is two years. It's a little bit different, but it's basically a more recent version of, of the plot. It's Bitstamp instead of Mt. Gox, okay, because Mt. Gox has actually been dying for, you know, like a year, and Bitstamp is, is a much more liquid, reliable exchange. Notice how similar it is. I mean, like, this was in, in you can't see the numbers. It's off the, the chart there, but the peak of this char of chart in 2011 was $1. So that's like the peak of that plot. And now the peak is like 600, or actually the peak of this one is like $1,000, right? So it's the same thing. Uh, it's, a, it's another exponential curve. So I want to talk about why I think Bitcoin is exploding. I mean, like, why this is absolutely incredible that this is happening. And we're still in the middle of this, I think. I don't see any reason to, to see that we're near the end of this. So these are what I call the forces that monetize Bitcoin. Uh, and I'll, I'll just talk about what all these are, but I think these are the reasons, if you think about what's happening in this space, why Bitcoin is exploding so quickly. So uh, the first one is the uh, intrinsic value. So this is a bit of a controversial subject. Uh, people think that gold has intrinsic value and, and Bitcoin doesn't. I think, I think Bitcoin has intrinsic value in the same way that gold has intrinsic value, which is that people like it. Because intrinsic value is not really in a thing, it's in our interpretation of that thing. So I think Bitcoin has intrinsic value for all these reasons. It's like this de delocalized gold. It's something you can send over the internet, um, and it has all the monetary properties of gold, but you can send it over the internet, unlike gold. It's got these interesting features, and that it fills a niche. It's useful to some people. Um, Bitcoin also has the first mover advantage. So it's got this nice, you know, interesting properties, uh, and it's also the first. So we, there are all these altcoins and stuff now that uh, share characteristics of Bitcoin, but Bitcoin was the first. Uh, third, we have the network effect, which is the fact that people in this space have an incentive to bring more people into the space because we all win. If I can bring more people into Bitcoin, this is part of the reason why I like going to conferences like this and talking with people and rallying more people on this, this sort of uh, this space, it's really better for all of us. I think it's a better 
monetary system than, the, than what I call the legacy financial system. It's win-win for all of us. So it's the network effect. And everybody in this space has an incentive uh, to spread the word about this. Now, there are problems with Bitcoin. I don't believe that Bitcoin is perfect. But I believe that all the problems are solvable. So we have an incentive. Everybody in this space, you hold Bitcoin, or even if you don't hold Bitcoin, even if you just believe in the idea of it or whatever, maybe you hold altcoins, you still have an incentive to fix the problems that arise in this space. So those are the four forces. Um, let me just go back and look, look at the list again. So intrinsic value, first mover, first mover network effect, self-interest. For all these reasons, Bitcoin just keeps growing. And I don't think there are going to be any altcoins that supplant Bitcoin unless they're fundamentally better than Bitcoin, which could happen. But I don't see any right now. Um, so I think Bitcoin is going to keep growing. So I think the implications of this are absolutely shocking. And I've, I've been saying this since 2011. That's why I was showing those plots from 2011 before. Um, this is a genuinely exponential curve, and we're still in the middle of this. So I like Robin Hansen's idea of an economic singularity. What this is, is it, it, imagine if there's some new type of technology that just radically increases human productivity. If that happened, we would have this, this pace of, of change where all of a sudden we go from having one type of society to having a totally different type of society. I believe that we're like in the middle of this right now and that, and that Bitcoin is this thing. Bitcoin is a technology. It encourages productivity because if you hold Bitcoin, you are encouraged to save your Bitcoin and produce more because you know how much wealthier you will be in the future. So, um, and it happens extremely rapidly. I mean, this is just clear if you look at what's happening in this space. It's happening unbelievably fast. Um, I, think, uh, I think the reason for that is because the internet is already here. So, um, you know, these ideas can spread so much faster than in history that ideas, you know, used to be able to spread. So I, I think that Bitcoin is the economic singularity. That's the word that I use. That's what's going on here. It's more than just a revolution. It's this shocking, fast change in the financial system that's, that's really just unprecedented. Um, and I think we're building a whole uh, crypto financial system. Uh, Bitcoin is just a piece of this, and I like to use the word Bitcoin. I'm a huge fan of Bitcoin itself. Um, but it's everything in this space. The altcoins included, right? I mean, it's everything. It's, it's all the companies. It's all the other pieces of, of open source software and stuff that are all in this space. This is the crypto financial system. Um, and I think that as people adopt Bitcoin, uh, people have less and less of an incentive to hold fiat currencies. And I think that for reasons that actually have nothing to do with Bitcoin, I, I don't have a whole lot of hope that fiat currencies are going to stick around. But even with Bitcoin, I think that the future looks really awful for, for fiat currencies. I think they're going to go away. So uh, this talk is supposed to be about my story. So uh, my personal story is, like I said, I found, uh, I discovered Bitcoin in 2011. Well, I was a, I was a PhD student at the, at the time. So here's just like, here's how close I am to getting a PhD, and people think that I'm ridiculous for doing this. Uh, but I, like, this is, this is the result of my research uh, as a PhD student. This is a, it's an upper limit on the TEV gamma ray flux uh, from dark matter annihilation in dwarf galaxies. Uh, and I used an experiment called Veritas to uh, observe dwarf galaxies and place an upper limit on the TV gamma ray flux. That's what this plot is. It's, no one would actually read this thesis, right? I mean, like, it's, it's a really cool subject. I love studying this stuff. But the reality is, like, this, this thesis would influence no one. It's, it's not a very interesting result. It, take, it takes so much effort to produce this. I, I just decided, like... Writing this thesis takes a significant amount of time, and I get a PhD out of it, but that's all I get out of it. And even though I've already done the research, several months' worth of time in PhD versus Bitcoin makes a huge difference, because Bitcoin is happening so fast. I would be passing up three months' worth of incredible opportunities in Bitcoin that my PhD doesn't give me anything like that. So here's, this is a, a, a chart of my interest in things. So interest in Bitcoin, physics, and academia. Um, you can see like my interest in Bitcoin suddenly spike when I discovered it. And my interest in academia has dropped, you know, just continuously. The whole time I'm in this space, I'm like, this careers are, I, I think academia is, is in a giant bubble. I think higher education is a giant bubble. I think that the way science is funded is just totally... Uh, just not sustainable. 
So, and what's happening right now is scientists are just all being driven out of this space. I work with a lot of scientists, and the scientists that are really good are really willing to live on very little money. And it's, it's not a good lifestyle unless you really actually care that much about the science. And a lot of people do, and so they keep doing it, but they're really pretty, pretty bad off, in my opinion. Um, so my interest in academia just, just slowly dropped uh, the whole time I was in academia. Um, so yeah, so I talked about the opportunity cost. And really, that's, that's the most important thing. Um, Bitcoin is just a better opportunity than a PhD. Um, so my story with, with Bitcoin is, so I discovered Bitcoin in 2011, um, and it was just a hobby of mine for, for a long time. Last year, like we keep, we, I showed those exponential curves earlier. Um, Bitcoin just keeps exploding this whole time. In 2011, it, it, it exploded so much, I started to realize, I don't know why I'm treating this as a hobby. This should be my career. I'm, I'm, this is an opportunity for, uh, you know, to be a part of a new industry that, uh, it, it, like, like the internet or something like that, where I can be in at the ground floor of this entire new industry, have a say in what's going to happen in this industry, and, you know, make a name for myself in this new space. Um, so uh, in early 2011, like, I basically like, spent more and more time just focused on Bitcoin. I spent a lot of time reading news and stuff like that. Um, I started trying to figure out what I could do in Bitcoin. So one of the things I did was literally like, research. Like, I had a history of being a web developer, so I thought that I was probably going to do web development. Um, so I researched the technologies I didn't know. And the, 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 the most important thing that I didn't already know was JavaScript. I knew things like HTML and CSS, if you guys are technical at all. I knew that stuff. I knew programming. But I just didn't know the language of JavaScript. So I studied JavaScript. This was literally last summer. And I just dedicated all my time to like mastering JavaScript. Um, and so I was trying to figure out what I could do in the, in the Bitcoin space. And I decided that like, I was living in St. Louis, which is where I was getting my PhD. And I decided I wanted to move to Panama. So I did all, I, like literally, like, I was like, this is the perfect place to go. I'm going to go to Panama. I'm going to start a business in Panama uh, because the taxes are low there. You can get a second passport in Panama. It's a beautiful country. It would be so awesome to live in Panama. So I literally like, had my bags packed and was ready to go to Panama when I was contacted by a recruiter from BitPay. And uh, the recruiter found me via people that I had met at a, con at a Bitcoin conference early, early on, uh, last, last May. Um, so it was just this very fortunate series of events. And BitPay is all based on JavaScript, which was the technology I had been dedicating myself to studying like this whole summer. So I was like, OK, I've mastered exactly the right skills for this job. So uh, I, I interviewed. People liked me. And uh, I got an offer from BitPay. And since I was literally had my bags packed, ready to go to Panama, I drove down to Atlanta in like less than 24 hours. So as soon as they gave me an offer, they're like, you know, can you fax us this contract? And I said, no, I'll just bring it to you. So I just literally got in my car at that moment and drove to Nashville, because that's in the middle, and stayed in Nashville, drove to Atlanta the next day, and have been in Atlanta since then, basically. Um, and that was last September. So I want to talk about what I'm, what I'm doing now. By the way, if you guys happen to have any questions or something, I mean, by all means, we're a small audience, so you can ask questions about this stuff. So this is going to be a little bit more technical. Um, so what I'm doing now is we have this great project called BitCore, which is a JavaScript implementation of Bitcoin. And uh, it's, it's inherited from a project called Bitcoin JS that was written by Stephen Thomas in 2011. And the guys at BitPay, before I got there, adopted this project and turned it into, you know, they, they, they updated it and they, they built it into this tool that's used internally at BitPay. And we've recently uh, open sourced this. We've made it available. I mean, it was already open source originally, but we've made our updates op open source and all that stuff. Um, and we're trying to, uh, you know, build a real ecosystem around this Bitcoin implementation. So basically, if you're doing any type of web project involving Bitcoin, uh, BitCore is a great project, web or, or node. So either on the server or on the browser with JavaScript, BitCore is an awesome tool. Um, so that's what I'm working on now. Uh, here are the guys. These guys here are, this is, uh, this is BitPay Argentina. And I spend, I, every single day I work with the first five people in that picture. Um, these are our developers in Argentina. There's a really just interesting story here. So uh, the guy number three there, uh, Matias, uh, he ran a company in Argentina. And they decided they were going to change their strategy, and they wanted to get into Bitcoin. So Matias got in contact with Tony, uh, CEO of BitPay. 
and arranged to start working for uh, BitPay. And so I got to like basically become a part of this team because I interact with I'm sort of the guy in Atlanta that links up these guys in Argentina. And together we all work on our open source projects that are focused on Bitcore. And the other people that work on uh, Bitcore are uh, Jeff Garzik and Stephen Pear. Uh, Stephen Pear is the CTO and Jeff Garzik is a Bitcoin Core developer. Uh, and it's those guys there are, are we're the guys you know, every single day trying to make Bitcore better. Um, so I want to talk about something I, I think is really important in this space. Um, uh, Brian, yes, can I ask you something about, absolutely. Will you talk more about Bitcore later, or can I, ask uh, I wasn't going to talk about the details. So if you have questions about Bitcore, sure. Right. More, more or less, Jared, you have to run, uh, run your own uh, Bitcoin D in the background of your server. That is you don't have to, uh, but we recommend that you do for validating blocks and transactions, uh, because. Uh, you want to be bug for bug compatible with other nodes on the network. So imagine if you wrote your own implementation of Bitcoin. Well, imagine you used Bitcore to like create your own daemon. If there's any subtle bug in the way that we're validating transactions, or even not a bug, maybe just a, a difference, um, it's you can go off on a, on a fork of the blockchain. So we recommend using Bitcoin D for validating blocks and transactions just to make sure you're 100% compatible with everybody else on the network. So you don't have to do that, but we recommend it. Yeah. And do you plan to uh, create some materials, some uh, example, basic, Absolutely. educational materials so that people can start using? Sure. So we have some examples. We have some very simple examples in our, uh, like if you just look at the readme on Bitcore, you can go to bitcore.io, click on the GitHub link, and you can view some really simple examples of using Bitcore. We have a, a really big project developed by those, the guys in Argentina that we just saw there. Uh, they developed a project called Insight, which is this uh, blockchain explorer type of website that we've created. It's all open source. That's the, the best example of using Bitcore. It is a, uh, it, it's, it, what it is primarily is an API for querying the blockchain and doing things that you can't do with just Bitcoin D. So for getting uh, the balance of an address, for example, the balance of an address is not something you can get from Bitcoin D. You would think you can, but you can't. So Insight does that, and it does other things that are relevant to querying the blockchain. So Insight is really the best example of using Bitcore. Um, so these are, I keep these principles in mind when I work on uh, Bitcoin stuff and this whole crypto finance space. Think about the way that Bitcoin works. Bitcoin is a financial system that's entirely voluntary, which is different than fiat currencies. Fiat currencies, you are forced to pay taxes in the fiat currency, like in, in the United States, you have to pay taxes in dollars. That's not voluntary. I mean, they sometimes use the word voluntary. It's not. You're forced to pay uh, with dollars. There's nothing, nobody's forcing you to do anything with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is entirely voluntary. Um, and that's, a, I, I think, a very important property of Bitcoin. Uh, there are other altcoins. If an altcoin is better than Bitcoin, no one is forcing you to use Bitcoin. You can use the altcoin instead. This allows competition to make sure that the one that wins is the one that's actually the best. So I think that's it's key and yeah. So another principle of course is decentralization. Uh, Bitcoin is decentralized. I think this is another principle that we should use when we develop stuff in this world. Uh, we should develop decentralized systems that don't have single points of failure. Um, if, the, if you have a human at the center, the human, look, humans are fallible. They mess up all the time. So let's make protocols that are decentralized so that humans can't have failings or even just some, some type of other failing. Like even if it's like, you know, just a central server somewhere, the server can fail or whatever. So decentralization is extremely valuable. And finally, open source so that anybody can understand what's going on and copy it and change it and improve it or whatever. So these are what I call the principles of crypto finance. And so I follow these principles. I try to follow these principles anyway myself in developing everything in this, in this world. Um, so my personal goals uh, moving forward with Bitcore are privacy and security. So I think privacy and security are, a lot of people in the Bitcoin world value these things, but the software is really immature right now. Uh, it's very difficult to be private with Bitcoin. Um, a lot of wallets, like, uh, well, I don't want to name names, but some wallets will send change back to the same address that you send from. Uh, I mean, that means people can just monitor everything you're doing. As soon as you accidentally reveal what Bitcoin address you own, somebody can look at all of your financial transactions. Um, so I think privacy is extremely important, and there are lots of strategies uh, to do that, which I'll cover in a second. And finally, uh, security. Um, people get hacked all the time. 
And we really got to put a stop to that. And the way we can do that is with multi-signature transactions. So let me cover uh, what I think are the best ways to increase privacy. And these are plans that we want to implement in Bitcore and get wallets doing these things. So mixing is like the most straightforward way to uh, include, you know, have some measure of privacy, which is where there's some type of service that lets people put their Bitcoins in and then send their Bitcoins out. And then your inputs are sort of disconnected from your output, so it's a lot more difficult for somebody monitoring the blockchain to see your financial history. Um, but it, you know, it has its downside. It's, it's, it is, relies on a central party. Um, it's not perfect. Another strategy is coin join, where many different people participate in the same transaction. Um, and this is another way of, of sort of, it's similar to mixing, but it doesn't rely on a, a third party so long as you and your friends all share this, this uh, you know, understand how to, to do this. And again, the software is just really immature at this point. Um, but it's, it allows you to sort of mix up your coins and, uh, you know, make it difficult for people to uh, monitor your tr uh, financial history. Um, another strategy is merge avoidance. Um, this is where rather than, like if you've received many different payments in the past, Rather than send, like suppose you've received like one Bitcoin, one Bitcoin, one Bitcoin, and you want to send three Bitcoins, you have to merge those transactions where you received the one Bitcoin into a single three Bitcoin transaction that you're sending. It's better to keep this stuff separate. Instead of sending one transaction with three where you're revealing the previous transactions that clearly the person sending all three of these is one person, and so you're linking those together, just keep them separate send three entirely distinct transactions. That way no one monitoring the blockchain knows that those transactions have anything to do with each other. And that's called merge avoidance. And again, like this is all possible already in principle, but the software just doesn't make it easy at all. And so we have to make the software you know, better so that you can actually do this stuff without going way out of your way to do it. Uh, and finally, self-addresses. This is a really interesting new idea. Well, actually, I think the idea goes way back, but it's been sort of worked out in detail recently, where you can have a public address that actually allows people to generate new actual addresses that they use to send you Bitcoins. Um, so rather than like reveal to everyone in the world what your Bitcoin address is, you're allowing them to generate new addresses that you can then retrieve those Bitcoins without other people knowing what Bitcoins you've received. So I think that all four of these strategies, these are the four that I know of, and I'm sure there, there are others or will be more. Um, I think we need to do all these. I think we need a wallet that makes it easy to use all of these privacy strategies. So that's something I want to see with Bitcore, is implementing these particular privacy strategies in Bitcore and having wallets use Bitcore uh, and you know, uh, actually use these privacy strategies. So, and, the, and next I want to talk about security. So, uh, normally uh, with Bitcoin, you have like your private keys that give you exclusive access to your Bitcoins. Well, there's, there are more advanced types of Bitcoin transactions that you can do. And for security purposes, uh, multi-signature transactions allow you to uh, have, like the, the best example would be a two of three multi-signature transaction where you and your two friends each have a private key and it requires two of you to sign the transaction in order to send those bitcoins. So that way if one of you gets hacked and your uh, private key is stolen, your bitcoins are not compromised because they've only hacked one of you and they haven't hacked two of you. At the same time, with a two of three multi-signature transaction, if somebody loses their keys or, or, they, or they get, you know, uh, you know whatever, some, they, uh, something happens in them or something like that, you only need two of the three people to be able to send the, bit, the bitcoins. But you can do this with any M of N. So the, the one like, business strategy, there are actually a, a few people at this conference uh, uh, creating businesses out of this idea where the server, like you interact with a service where the server keeps one of the keys and they just offer this as a paid service. You pay a monthly fee where they keep one of the keys. You keep two of the other keys and you sort of back one of them up and you keep one of them as the key that you use on a regular basis. Um, and you know the, the server can do things like make sure that you're not spending too many bitcoins because if you are then it might be fraudulent or something like that. So uh, that's the sort of two of three strategy uh, 
a more general strategy is what I said before, where you sort of share keys with your friends. So I think this would be more appropriate for a company where you have maybe five different keys and maybe three of the people or four of the people or something are required to spend the money. Um, so yeah, we need, we need, we need like everything in this. Like this is technically possible in Bitcoin, but the software is all just really uh, immature at this point and it's very difficult to do this stuff in practice. We need all this stuff to be easy to use. So imagine like, you know, any existing wallet, like I personally uh, like blockchain.info. I think it's an awesome wallet. I want blockchain.info to include all of these privacy strategies and all of these security strategies so that I can have privacy and security in my wallet. So that's what I want. And I think, uh, I, I, I hope we can do this with Bitcoin because uh, since JavaScript is so widely used um, and uh, it's so widely available on computing platforms. It's a really good way to create any type of software, but especially, you know, Bitcoin wallets. Um, so I just want to implement all of these things in Bitcore and make it possible for people to create the, these types of secure wallets that I personally want to use. Um, so in summary, uh, I think Bitcoin is just an incredible opportunity. Um, I quit my PhD because as cool as a PhD is and as valuable as it is, Bitcoin is so much better. Bitcoin is a genuine revolution. I think this is, and like I said, it's, it's, a, it's the economic singularity. This is not just your, you know, a normal, like, you know, invention of, it, it, it's sort of like, you can imagine a technology like, you know, the printing press or something like that, or railroads, except it's happening on such a compressed scale, and it's making such a big difference, it's really unlike anything else in history. So I like the word singularity for that because it's, it's exactly what you think of when you think of like the technological singularity. It's the same idea. It's this incredible change happening in a short period of time. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm working on Bitcore and I've been going around here trying to advocate that people help us work on Bitcore and uh, you know, contribute. It's all, it's all open source. Um, you, know, you can download it and use it and fork it or whatever. And I just want more and more people working on JavaScript and Bitcoin and making all these things happen. And, you know, like I said before about Bitcoin being win-win, um, as we develop the software, this is for all of us. We'll all be better off once we have better privacy and security in wallets. So I really hope that, you know, actually I'm extremely, like, I'm not the only person saying this stuff. Like, I'm very happy to see, like, so many people here are interested in multi-signature transactions and privacy. So all this stuff is happening, and it's really great to see all that stuff. So anyway, that's it. Uh, and uh, check out our uh, github.com slash bitpay, and you can see our open source software. Um, so that's it. Thank you. So, so Ryan, do you yeah. see, uh, do you see Bitcore as a way to uh, add features that could potentially be implemented in the Bitcoin reference client that would take maybe forever or for Absolutely, yeah. So I, I, the way I see that is, yeah, the way I see that is, well, it really depends on what's going to happen with the reference client. So I think Bitcore and other open source projects are a way to implement more experimental features into Bitcoin and test them out. Just like altcoins are a way to uh, test out, you know, making changes to the blockchain or something like that. So absolutely, Bitcore is a way that we can experiment. And if something is really good, then maybe we put it in the reference client later, right? So absolutely, that's definitely one of the goals here. And we can be more experimental with Bitcore and put more stuff. In fact, we already do. We have uh, our own sort of uh, identity system based on SINs. So one of, the, one of the problems in this whole internet world is allowing people to have a, a form of identity that is decentralized, that doesn't depend on a, a central party. And so we uh, use the same cryptography of Bitcoin to create a, what we call a SIN, which is like a Bitcoin address that lets you sign data and authenticate yourself. And it's the early stages of this. It's, it's, you know, we only have some bits and pieces of it in the code, and there's a lot more we could go, do with it. But that's an example of a more experimental feature that is already in Bitcore. So we can do anything, anything you can think. All these experimental things that people want to do, um, we can absolutely do stuff like that in Bitcore and explore that and figure out whether we want to put it in the reference client. One more comment on that, though, which is, um, I kind of see the reference client maybe ending up being a v sort of this tool you use to have a full node. 
But I'm not sure I see ordinary people really using the reference client in the future. Um, it'll, be, it'll be like a daemon that runs on your computer if you're really sophisticated or whatever. Um, I don't see it continuing to be a wallet that people actually use in practice. And already, I mean, most people use other wallets. So I think the reference client might not get the more advanced features because it doesn't need it. It just needs to be a good full node. And these other features can just stay in BitCore and other uh, open source projects. So, or closed source for that matter. But. All right. Yeah, if you, have, if you have another question, go right ahead. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, what kind of uh, resources that does BitPay devote to BitCore? Is it something that now has some momentum and maybe? Well, I'll put it this way. Uh, we have like about half of our developers focused on Bitcore. So we're taking it very seriously. Um, we're putting a whole lot of uh, resources into Bitcore. Um, you know, I, I personally, I probably spend more than half of my time working on Bitcore. I also work on just BitPay.com, um, but probably more than half of my time is dedicated to Bitcore right now. And all the guys in Argentina, they're 100% focused on Bitcore. So we're, we're taking this up very seriously. Um, and just one more comment along that. So Jeff Garzik, Bitcoin Core developer, like he spends most of his time working on you know, the, the reference client. So you know, we take all this stuff uh, very seriously. We're very dedicated to open source. And uh, you know, like I said, the principles of crypto finance, voluntary, decentralized, open source, we take all this stuff very seriously. So we're dedicating a lot of resources to it. And what, what is the business? Is there a business model behind that, or is there a general philosophy? There is. No, absolutely. So, I mean, the core business at BitPay, of course, is that we, like, sign up merchants, and typically they pay us a monthly fee to use our service. We want everybody in the world using Bitcoin, right? Like, we can sign up more merchants if there are better tools in the Bitcoin world for people to use, for businesses to use. So our strategy is... We want to just build out this whole ecosystem because we get more merchants on board, right? Like it's, yeah, it's, it's sort of a more of a high level thing, but that's, I, it, I think that's the best strategy, right? Like that's literally the goal. Yeah. Just like Google has given up the internet because we know more people online. Exactly, exactly, just like Google, yeah. So, so just uh, creating, creating the better privacy and security to drive adoption in general. Exactly. I mean, just think about how important it is to businesses that they have good security. Like, we can sign more businesses on at BitPay if they can have complete confidence that they're not going to be hacked like they hear about in the news, right? We can say, no, we've got better technology, <laughs> and we can... Right now, that's the big thing that, that you know, oh, it's all getting... Well, it's, it's one of the big things. I mean, there are many big things, but that is definitely one of them, right? I mean, like, people need to know that they're not going to just lose their Bitcoins. So security is extremely important, and so is privacy. Companies don't want their entire financial transactions visible to everyone on the network, right? They, they don't want to... If they use the same address for all their transactions and it leaks what their address is, then other people can see their financial history. Companies want to keep that stuff private. So it's, it's better for us, it's better for everybody in the Bitcoin world. It's an, it's, it's an example of this win-win thing. It's, it's good for us if all this stuff in the whole Bitcoin ecosystem is better because we can sign more merchants on board. So, yeah. Yep, helps the whole industry. Yeah. Sure. You know, you, you look back throughout history and you look at, at, at all kinds of different currencies. You, you go all the way back to, you know, the early United States and, and you had this free-for-all banking system and all these local banks printing mm -hmm. their own currencies. And in a certain sense, we're kind of headed back, possibly, with, with all these different altcoins into an ecosystem like that. And what I, I, I kind of wonder if we might not, because in the past, your, your currency boundaries would have been... Uh, you know, physical or eventually political, um, but I wonder if maybe we're going to see a range from very specialized currencies at, at one end of the spectrum with maybe some very specific features that are maybe even made just for one particular industry, mm -hmm. and maybe at the end you'll see more general use. Sure. I, I think Bitcoin is, is more of the general use end, yeah. but I wonder if we might see more specialized. Any, any thoughts on no, that? No, I, I, I think I agree with your assessment. Now, here's how I would put it. Um, like I said with Bitcoin, Bitcoin has the network effect. I think, I think if, if anything is going to deserve the title money in the future, it's going to be Bitcoin. But Bitcoin is, there are going to be other things like Bitcoin. All these altcoins are going to continue to exist. They're going to continue to have uses. They're going to continue to have value. I absolutely expect to see more and more specialized currencies and things like that. But 
I, I think Bitcoin itself will still be like the money of the future uh, because it, for all the, the, the four forces I stated, like we all have an incentive to keep using this as sort of the money. Like unless something is fundamentally better than Bitcoin as just money, I, I can't see it replace. I can't see it beating the momentum of Bitcoin. I can't see it like what what features would it offer that beat Bitcoin? And and I could be maybe I maybe I can't foresee what type of features it would offer, and that's my own lack of foresight. And so something like that could beat Bitcoin. But it have to be better. I mean, it have to be something that was better than Bitcoin as money. But I totally, totally expect there to be more and more altcoins, more and more specialized things. Like Ethereum, that's a, a fascinating technology. I don't see Ethereum being the money of the future personally, but I totally see Ethereum and things like Ethereum having uses and, and being a part of this whole crypto financial system. I think it's a, a certain infrastructure. Yeah, I, I just, I, I wonder if you might see, um, I mean, let's say, let's take an example. Say I was a let's say I was a mall owner, and okay, maybe Bitcoin is kind of what people sure. spend all over the place. Let's say I create my own local currency that you know, almost like a gift certificate, more more like. So it works locally, but let's say I, I tell my customers, hey, uh, and and this is something you see in uh, what's the one they had up in uh, uh, Massachusetts, Berkshire's, yeah, where they said, okay, you change your dollars into Berkshire's and we give you five percent more. Mm -hmm. Why do we do that? Because that helps us bring money to the local economy. So I wonder if you might see some local competition. I'll tell you what. I see something just like Berkshire's. There is a currency that some people are trying to start in Iceland, where it is a cryptocurrency for the country of Iceland. It is the exact same idea as Berkshire's. It is a cryptocurrency for a local region, right? Um, say it again. Mazacoin. Oh, is that another one? Okay, I haven't heard of that one, but yeah, it sounds like the same idea. So, absolutely, man. I, I see all that stuff, like all these things and things that I can't foresee of. All this stuff is going to exist. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I, I currently work in, uh, in IT. I do data center work. I'm a network architect of uh, City of San Antonio. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I wonder if, if you might see, you know, more institutional and large corporate environments start to see, you know, start adopting this technology. Oh, definitely. I think that uh, we are, you know, there, there are stages in this world. So um, I've been into Bitcoin for three years. So I, relative to a lot of people now, I, I didn't feel like an early adopter when I got in because other people had been in even longer than I had. But now people, th people like talk to me and they think I'm an early adopter. I don't feel that way, but I guess I am now. Um, and in this time, like, like we recently entered the VC era where venture capitalists got interested in Bitcoin and started funding Bitcoin companies. That pretty much happened last year. Before last year, there was far less venture capital interest in Bitcoin. There was some, but very little. So I, I, would, I would say that early 2013 was sort of the era of VCs in Bitcoin. And there will be other eras. There'll, there's going to be another era where large corporations adopt Bitcoin and keep their treasury in Bitcoin, right? Th that's going to be another one of these eras. So I totally, I totally expect to see that. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I bet it'll be soon because we're on this exponential trend. Like, as, as this whole world develops, um, it feeds on itself, right? It's like it, it, uh, it, it, the, more, the more infrastructure exists, the faster more infrastructure can, can, can uh, be created. So like the ceiling is just the whole of humanity. Once everybody's into the Bitcoin world, uh, then it won't grow as rapidly. But we've got a, a whole lot of space left to grow, and absolutely, big companies, they will accept it. And uh, yeah, that'll be that'll be that that'll be a very interesting era when that happens. All righty, no more questions. So can Think. You talk a little yeah. Bit actually, about uh, these alternative, potentially better currencies. What what happens? I mean, Bitcoin is open source. Right? Like, yeah, absolutely. So my response to that is. Like, I define money as having certain key properties. Like, I'm not sure if I'll be able to remember them, but it's things like divisibility, uh, scarcity, um, uh, uh, fungibility, where it's like, you know, it's the same, like one Bitcoin is the same as another one Bitcoin, stuff like that. Um, Bitcoin has all those properties. Like, it just, it, it solves the problem of money. Like, I don't see anything else, like, I, 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 and this, again, like, I don't have a mathematical proof of this, but I don't, 
I can't see of a way that you could be better money than Bitcoin. Um, so I can see altcoins existing as other things, but I just can't see them overcoming the momentum of Bitcoin as money. So that's how I see that. Like I just Bitcoin being the first, you know, having these key features, um, having the the network effect. Um, I can't see something overtaking it as money, but I can totally see these other things existing as other things. Do you see Bitcoin as changing to sort of include those features as they're validated? Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. Possibly, but I'm not sure the incentives of people in the Bitcoin space are in favor of making radical changes to Bitcoin. People are very, very careful to make any type of big change to Bitcoin. Like you could imagine, suppose, some, suppose somebody like there's some mathematician somewhere that proved that if only the money supply were, you know, elastic, that the economy would be better. Imagine trying to convince the Bitcoin world that we need to continuously bump up the number of Bitcoins forever. You'd make everybody in the space angry. It would never happen. So there is, there's definitely like bounds on how much Bitcoin can change. But I think that's okay because I think that Bitcoin shows the right properties from the start. I think the fixed supply is key um, and it has properties that make it sufficient you know, to be money indefinitely. I don't think those key properties need to change. So I can see it changing, but I can't see it changing fundamentally. And it doesn't matter because it can, it can be money. So. All right. Thanks, guys.